I started a website called raingardens.org and some students made this wonderful really short video about rain gardens that tells you all about it. There we go. I haven't seen this in a while. I bet I look a lot younger. Let's see. A rain garden can be a beautiful addition to your landscape. It attracts birds and butterflies, and it's easy to install and maintain. It's not just flowers, it's a rain garden. A beautiful solution to water pollution. Stormwater runoff creates problems in the water cycle. The cycle of water moving and being stored on the earth starts out as rain, as everybody knows, or snow. Falls to the ground, it'll hit a vegetated area like grass or a farm field. When it hits that, then the water infiltrates into the soil, it moves through the ground, and finds its way to a river, a stream, or a lake. As soon as it hits pavement, it'll immediately run off, um, and that'll end up usually in a storm sewer, which goes to a river. The Great Lakes Basin is one of the largest freshwater systems in the world. About 20% of the world's fresh surface water is stored here, which is about 90% of the fresh surface water in the United States. Up to 70% of pollution in our surface waters is carried there by stormwater. And much of this comes from the things we do in our yards, streets, and parking lots. Well, if you go downtown and stand on the roof of the building and look around, everything you see around you will be hard surfaces. So anytime a drop of rain falls on a roof or a sidewalk or a parking lot, it gathers with other raindrops and it creates something called sheet flow. And the water runs to the low spot by gravity. For the most part, people think that that stuff just, you know, after a rainstorm, all the stuff in the parking lot will just end up going to wastewater treatment plant. But that, in fact, is not true. Almost all of it will go to a storm sewer, and it won't get treated, and it will go directly to the river. And those aquatic organisms are not well adapted to the salts, the heavy metals, oil, antifreeze, any of that stuff. We don't want streams and rivers and lakes with signs up that say unsafe for bodily contact. You know, that's a place where, where the water is not Just safe for safe. people. Um, it's not safe for anything. If you put an inch of rain on an acre of property, and if that property is, is asphalt or concrete, that one acre collects over 27,000 gallons of water that goes into a pipe and goes into the river. So you can imagine in the city of Grand Rapids, where we have all of these hard surfaces, there's lots and lots and lots of water that's collected and channeled into the Grand River when water runs across the parking lot or the street or the sidewalk, all of that stuff from our careless acts gets collected and gets put into the river. So if we can stop the water from doing that, then we have stopped that source of pollution going into the river. Rainwater wasn't meant to run off our lands. Rain gardens are designed to retain, absorb, and filter rainwater. One of the things that make rain gardens different from traditional gardens is that rain gardens feature the use of perennial plants native to our region. Some traditional non-native plants may also be used. Once you get the native plants established, they don't have to be fertilized, they don't have to have pesticides, they need little or no watering once they're established, whereas other perennials uh, really need to be baby, and they're susceptible to a lot of diseases and insects and things like that, whereas the natives are really, really tough. So by using these native plants back in the landscape, we can start providing habitat for native birds, butterflies, and animals, and really start having that back in our communities, whereas before we were kind of a wasteland of lawn. If we allow the water to go where it wants to soak in and, and uh, flow naturally, uh, that eliminates costly infrastructure and things that we have to build and take care of. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen all at once, but I think over 
decades, I think if we change the way that we do things, that we can make a huge difference. And the neat thing about Rain Gardens of West Michigan is that anybody can make a difference. I can make a difference. Installing rain gardens on the lawns of schools, businesses, and homes can help eliminate stormwater runoff. For more information, go to www.raingardens.org. Rain Gardens, saving the Great Lakes one garden at a time. That was fun. There, because <laughs> I think it just keeps going. I think we're going to do this. All right. So, boink. Yep. Oh, goody, now we can get this to work. Well, I have all kinds of goodies for you. That was actually kind of fun for me to see that video again, because it looks like I've gained about 20 pounds. <laughs> so that's going to be an inspiration for me to lose that. Let's see if I can get this to work. I wanted to do a little overview of rain gardens because in that video they don't really go into it very well and there's a handout you can pick up on your way out that explains it really really well but I think this diagram explains it really well too. There's supposed to be, yep there's a little thing in here. The, the big deal is that the easiest place to put a rain garden is where water's already going. So you put it in a place, usually I tell people to run a, run a hose on the ground and see where the water's going, or if you have a spot where water goes and sits when it rains, that's usually a good place for a rain garden because that's where the water's already going. Otherwise, you have to find some way to get the water to go there. And here they've got a little gravel channel for it to run down, and then some people even do a pipe. I've seen it done both ways. And rain gardens don't really have to be very big either. And a lot of the reason for that, you're going to find out. I love this picture because everything is in there. Rain gardens are important because of the Great Lakes. We're like right here right now, and we have lots and lots of Great Lakes to take care of. How many of you like to go swimming? Yeah, me too. I can hardly wait. When I was putting this slideshow together, I saw all kinds of pictures of people swimming. So I was ready for that. How many of you have seen a parking lot with lots of water in it like that? Yeah, me too. Does it happen at your school? Yeah. Yeah, lots and lots of water. You could put a rain garden at your school. That would be a cool project. So you get water running off of a parking lot like this, and usually what, what it does is it goes through a pipe somewhere into a storm drain and then out into a river, a lake, or a stream, just like that. And the whole idea of rain gardens is instead of doing that, you put it into a garden. How many of you have seen parking lots looking like this? It's that time of year, isn't it? And look at, I, I can't park like that, but he can. He's got four-wheel drive. But look at all this dirty snow. And what's going to happen to that disgusting, dirty water after it melts? It's going to leak dirty water. Yeah, that dirty water is going to go down into the storm drain, probably, and off into some lake that you really actually care about and would want to swim in. Have you ever seen a storm drain that looked like this? Yeah? What is that stuff? Water. Oil. What's that? Oil. Oil and gas from cars. And that's going in there too. And a lot of the time, if you go down to the, the local government, you can ask them where the storm drains go and they can actually show you. They usually have a map. That might be an interesting thing to do. So I did it where I live and I found out all kinds of things. So your storm drain may be connected to White Lake. You just don't know. You're going to have to do some investigating and find out. So if somebody puts 
their yard waste and dirt that they sweep off their lawn into the storm drain, it might end up in the lake. And the ducks don't look very happy about that. And if somebody fertilizes their lawn because they want it to be nice and green, and they put too much on, and then they wash it off and it goes down the storm drain, where is it going to end up? In your house? In, in the lake. In the lake. In the lake. And then, what if somebody walks their dog and the dog poops? And they pick it up because they don't want you to step in it, but what if they dump it in the storm drain? And the storm drain goes to the lake. And the poop goes in the lake. And the poop goes in the lake. So, sometimes I live on a river and sometimes I have to tell people, don't throw your poop in the river. That's where you go fishing because that's what they do there. <laughs> and then they go, oh, I never thought of that. Not, People need to think about that because it can make you sick and it can make the people downstream sick and the people in the lake sick. A lot of people end up with lakes with a sign that says don't swim here, it's not safe for your health. And you end up with really sick fish too because fish can't get out. Here's a little slide of something I thought was really cool that shows how plants can actually make water cleaner. They put the same amount of water into each one of these things and the water ran through the soil and then through all of this thing and out the bottom and into here. And you can see this one's really dirty and this one's a little cleaner and this one looks pretty good. So this is acting kind of like a little rain garden in a pot. Does anybody know how to remember the names of the Great Lakes? <laughs> Not really. There, there's a thing that you could remember called Holmes. Can you remember Holmes? It's H-O-M-E-S. So it's Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Holmes. Somebody in Washington, D.C. taught me that. <laughs> I was trying to remember them all, and this guy in, in the, the Capitol building knew them all, and he wasn't even from Michigan. So we have one-fifth of the fresh water right here on the planet. That's amazing. And if you go somewhere else where the Great Lakes aren't, water is a really big deal. Here, we're so used to it, we just use it and play in it and water our gardens with it and we don't worry about it because we've got so much, but other places don't have it. We really need to take good care of it and rain gardens are one way to do that. Well, here's another lake I bet you guys care about, right? What lake is that? Say it loud. What is it? White Lake. Yeah, it's White Lake. And we are, let's see, I like, these are from, from Google Maps, you can go find where you are. We're right here, and I'm going to show you some rain gardens that are right there. Did you know you have rain gardens here in Whitehall? Pretty cool. They don't look like much right now, but they're going to look, they're going to be coming up pretty soon. Who's ready for this? I'm ready. Who's ready for that? Does anybody know who those kids are? No. I keep hoping somebody's going to know who they are. I took their picture and I don't know them. <laughs> but th this, this was right down at Duck Lake. Yep. It was just such a beautiful day. I'm ready for summer. Yeah, they could be from anywhere. Well, because of all that water, lots of kids in Michigan are now putting in rain gardens in their school. So this is a school rain garden. There's a storm drain that goes to their lake or river or stream. So they're doing, doing it right there, but you can also do it at home. You can put in just a little bitty rain garden at home and have a rain garden at your house. I've got one. So here's a really cool little rain garden right here. They don't have to be really big. Um, I know some people who took the spot where all these legs are standing without heads and they put rain gardens right there and right there, they made, made a little space so you could park your car and walk between the rain gardens. So you can put them just about anywhere. 
and they're really, really pretty. This, this is the house of a friend of mine. He's got a little rain garden in the front. And he had a little problem with this, and we'll talk about that too, which is he got his rain garden in, and it looks beautiful, doesn't it? But it's full of weeds. And he didn't know which were the weeds and which were the plants he should keep, which is something else that we're going to talk about, about how to tell which, which are your plants that you really want. And he didn't want... He didn't know he didn't want it. He didn't want this goldenrod. Not because it's a bad plant, but because it's very weedy. And he didn't need it in there. <laughs> he had plenty of other plants. Here, here's a few other little examples of rain gardens. Just to give you an idea, people get really creative with them. And they have lots and lots of fun making them with their families. Um, here's a great big one that's taking care of a parking lot. And all the water is running off this parking lot. Here's a little homeowner rain garden. Look at this one with the nice border around it. It's really kind of pretty. I'm really ready for gardening. <laughs> These rain gardens are in the state capitol in Lansing on Michigan Avenue. And they're in fences. Now that's interesting. So nobody would eat them. Well, so nobody, probably so nobody would eat them and so nobody would step in them and fall in them too. <laughs> So that's really a good idea. Oh, that's a good idea. Put a fence on them so the deer won't eat them. In fact, I know people who fence their rain gardens so deer won't eat them because they're full of deer snacks. Here's another rain garden in Grand Rapids. This is at Habitat for Humanity. And all the water from their big parking lot over here comes down and fills up this rain garden and soaks into the ground. Instead of going into a storm sewer and heading off to the Grand River. And this is a rain garden that's actually in Toledo at the zoo. Even zoos have rain gardens now. Everybody's getting into it. I went to Oregon, which was over on the Pacific Ocean, and the place was full of rain gardens. All the schools had them. Lots of the houses had them. It was really neat. Really, really exciting. Here's another school rain garden that some kids plant. This is kind of what they look like when you first plant them. They don't look like anything. But they get really, really beautiful, like this rain garden here. This one is in, where is this? This is in Indiana. This one is. Does anybody know the name of these native plants? Anybody know what those are? What are they? Coneflowers? Yeah, those are coneflowers. Purple coneflowers. Those are some of my favorites, and I actually brought some seeds of purple coneflowers for you to plant and take with you. One of the reasons that people like to put prairie plants, our native prairie species, <coughs> into rain gardens is because they have really deep roots. I need a drink of water. Like here, this man right here is six feet tall. I'm five feet tall. So he's like, wow, that tall. And look, that grass is taller than he is. And right over here, this is that same plant. And I, I like these charts. So it grows seven feet tall. This grass grows seven feet tall. And then it has roots that grow to be nine feet deep. Now, how do you think they found out how deep those roots grow? That's kind of weird. By digging it. They dug it up. You're right. That's exactly what they did. They dug them up. Here, somebody dug up a prairie. And these roots right here are 10 feet long. Pretty interesting. Look at all the roots underground. So a lot of what makes your rain garden work is the roots. <laughs> in the soil and then you have a beautiful garden on top to enjoy. Yeah. Part of the thing that you need to look at is to select the right plants for your garden. So you have to figure out whether you have soil, sun or shade, whether it's dry all the time, most of the time, or wet all the time. Around here you have a lot of sandy soil so you pr probably ought to go with sandy soil plants. But for instance this plant is columbine and it likes to be in dry sandy soil. It'll grow anywhere. This is a blue flag iris and it likes to have its feet wet. It likes to sit in water. So this probably 
would kind of suffer in your rain garden if it wasn't wet all the time and this would probably do really well on the edges. Well this is where the rain gardens are over at Alcoa Halmet. They took this big property here and turned it into a, a big garden with flowers and all kinds of stuff. And you see this little spot right here? Yeah. That's a rain garden. And there is another rain garden right here. So the water from this parking lot runs off and goes right in there. And the water from the road and from this driveway goes right in there into that rain garden. And they're really, really beautiful. Ooh. Yeah, this is that big garden, the big prairie planting in the middle. And these are some of the plants that were out there. This is orange butterfly weed. It's something that monarch butterflies really, really like. And there is a monarch butterfly. I took that picture in that rain garden over at Halmet. And he was busy having nectar. They like all different kinds of milkweeds. That is swamp milkweed right there. And here is a monarch caterpillar. And I found him off in the woods. There was another kind of milkweed there. They like to eat milkweed. So that's why monarchs hang around all those milkweed plants all the time. Here's a purple coneflower. Guess what, what they like? They like the, the, same, the same one that you like. They, they, like, they yeah. like eating off of these plants. And then later, birds like to eat the seeds off of these purple coneflowers. That's a great spangled fritillary right there. These are some of the seeds that I brought. And the seeds are really interesting. I've got four different kinds of seeds and then kind of a mixture of prairie seeds. These are pale purple coneflower. You notice they're a little bit different from, from the regular coneflowers because the regular ones have petals that are kind of stiff and they stick out and they don't, kinda, they don't move very much. And these have petals that kind of swing and they hang down. And I think they're really, really pretty. So I brought you some seeds of those. And you'll see they look like little tiny triangles. Now another plant that I brought is cup plant. And cup plant is a really cool plant, but you have to be ready for it. Because from a little tiny seed, it grows this big. Well, so it's just huge. And this guy's six feet tall, so that's seven feet tall. They'll actually grow eight feet tall. And they make a clump that's about five feet wide, which is about this wide. It kind of looks like a sunflower. It looks like a sunflower. I had those in my, the house I lived in the backyard. Yep, it, it looks like a sunflower. Nice they, they can actually grow just three feet tall in bloom. And I have one in my yard that is doing all right. And it grows about five or six feet tall. They spread too. But they have huge, huge roots. And they also attract everything. They attract butterflies, they attract birds that like to eat the seeds, and they attract frogs. Because the reason that they're called cup plants is because they make cups. They have these little cups that they make with their leaves, and the stem comes up in them, and they fill up with water when it rains, and then frogs go and live in those cups. Now, I've never seen a cup plant without frogs. It's really kind of cool. So, I've got cup plant seeds too. And this is Lanceleaf coreopsis, and this is one of our native species of plants that was growing in Michigan before it was settled. So there was nobody living here except the Potawatomi Indians. And these were growing here, and they're still growing here, and I brought some seeds of these. Coreopsis is really a pretty, pretty plant. Birds like to eat the seeds, and they also attract butterflies. Now you may have actually seen these before, but you weren't like me, you weren't the crazy lady with the camera. I jumped out of my car and went and took these pictures because I knew what this was. This is smooth penstemon and it attracts butterflies and it's just beautiful. Isn't that a pretty looking thing? And these are black swallowtail butterflies. So I took this picture probably about two miles from here right at the side of the road. So these actually like to grow here and they actually like to be a little bit wet. And they also attract hummingbirds. I did not take this picture. 
but I'm going to try and get a hummingbird eating out of those flowers because I love hummingbirds. Okay. Now, when you get to the point where which is the weed and you just don't know, I mean if it has a flower on it, then you sort of figure it belongs in the rain garden, but you can't always recognize these flowers because a lot of people aren't familiar with the native species of Michigan. So, there's a company that I bought those, the seeds from. It's called Prairie Nursery. I think I have enough of these so that every household can take one of these home. And it's the Prairie Nursery catalog. And they'll give these to you free. So if you want more or you didn't get one, you can go to their website and I'll have their website in the slideshow too. The fun thing about this is, and I'll just start, well, no, I won't pass them around because I'm a teacher and I know you'll look at them. <laughs> I'll let you wait. So the fun thing about this is, this is like a wonderful reference book to our native prairie species. And there are all these fabulous pictures and descriptions in there and they tell you what kind of birds like them and what kind of butterflies they attract and how to take care of them. And they're just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful catalogs. So got to thank Prairie Nursery for sending these for you. I called them up and asked them and they sent me a bunch. They said, let, let us know if you need more. So we may need some more. There's also the JF New Catalog, which is also online. That's another company where you can get seeds or plants. Prairie Nursery also sells plants. They'll, they'll ship them to you as well as seeds. Their catalog is a lot more complicated because they do a lot more engineering kinds and restoration kinds of things. But that's another really good place. Here's their old catalog. Their catalogs are always so pretty. Look at all the nice pictures and all the descriptions and everything. Well, these are the websites. Prairie Nursery has the free catalog. JF New is gone green and you can get their catalog as a PDF or you can look at it online and go to their website. And then there is that little acronym there, the, the MNPPA. That is the Michigan Native Plant Producers. And I printed that little thing off for you. This changes every year. These are people who grow Michigan's native plants. And it's not like they're a store where you can go there and get a basket and go shopping. A lot of these people are just doing it at their home or their farm. And they don't have regular business hours. So you have to call and find out when they're actually open for sales. Or you have to make an appointment with them. Or just tell them what, what you need and they just get it together and send it to you. So it's a little bit different. It's not like going to Meyer and getting a bunch of plants. But they do have, a lot of them specialize in different kinds of plants. So they're a really good resource. What else have we got? Aha! It is time. Now, we're going to turn on the lights. I think we are. And we're going to be making these guys. And let me see what else we got here. Yeah, we got the Prairie Nursery website up there. If anybody wants to look at it. And that's all we got. So this little thing right here, I'm going to put this up here. Here's what we do. Where did I leave it? There it is. I buried it. What we do is we have bowls with seeds in. So we have all these, this, this is a little bowl of prairie seeds and I want you to kind of look. There's all different kinds of seeds. Some of them float around and some of them just fall right down. And you're going to get to look at all these seeds because I'm going to put them over on the table. But some of them are big and they look like sunflower seeds. Those are cup plant seeds that they like to eat. And some of them are carried around by the wind. We just messed up the floor. There's a prairie on the floor now. So there's all kinds of ways that, that the seeds get spread around. What we're going to do is we're going to make a little origami cup. How many of you know what origami is? What's origami? You were fast. Yeah, it's folding paper. It's, a, it's an art from Japan 
where you can make all kinds of different things. You can actually make a cup like this one and you can actually drink water out of this. We're not going to do that tonight but when you go home, because you guys are all going to be experts when we're done doing this, you can actually put water in there and drink it. Of course you can't put it anywhere because it'll tip over. Now the thing about these cups is once you make them, most people want to fold these up so they can keep what's inside in there and what happens then is it just falls apart. So what we're going to do is we're going to make our cups and I'm going to need some, some good folding helpers. Who? Oh good, we got good folding helpers. Okay, so we'll have folding helpers at that table over there to help make the cups and there's the instructions up there and I'll show you how it's done. Then you're going to take your cup that you folded over to the dirt table which has the blue tarp on it and we're going to put a scoop of dirt in there, just a scoop so it doesn't get too full and then we're going to look at the seeds on the table with the green circle and there's different kinds of seeds in every single bowl. I don't think these seeds will hurt anyone who's, come back here, who's young enough to uh, put things in their mouth. I think they're all safe seeds. However, I do have some exotic butterfly seeds <laughs> that I brought along and you have to be careful that really young people don't get into these. But I think you should take these butterflies home because what's going to happen is you're going to take your, your cup plants and cups home. We're going to staple it shut so nothing falls out. We're going to put it in a bag and you'll go home and plant this. You can either plant it outside or you can get a pot at home and put some potting soil in it and plant it in there and grow it in the windowsill. But really, these prairie plants like to be outside and you can actually put them in a pot out in the snow and wait until spring and eventually they're going to come out and sprout up and you might get a cup plant that's eight feet tall in your garden with frogs living in it and birds and butterflies. So because you have to wait for that, I thought we'd just start with some butterfly seeds that you can take home. So are we, are we ready to do some folding? So pretty much what you're saying is you can take that construction paper and just plant the whole thing in it. Yeah, you can plant the whole thing. This is newsprint. I used to do this with newspaper. I did that once because by the end of, end of the hour my face was completely black and so were my hands. So now I buy newsprint and cut it up. I think we might have enough for everybody to make two cups. There, there's instructions up there too if you get stuck. Is that how you do it? I'm a quick learner. It's pretty close. That's pretty good. Is it holding together? There, let's see. Excellent. Look at how. Well, there's, there's a little strange thing there though. <laughs> so see this one's this one's like that. Okay, fold it, fold it in half like this. Here, see, T take a look at this. So when you get this far, you got it folded in half. So it's it's like a big chicken beak. Quack 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 quack. So you got a chicken beak. Then. You take this corner and you put it up there. Now see see how it's straight across here? Oh, that's perfect. That looks great. Then you fold this one across like that. You want to do another one? So it lines up? Yep. So, yep, so it lines up like that. Then you fold the top flap down and you have one on one side and one on the other. And there's a cup. Just squeeze. Okay, actually, you, you can, I think you can take a pinch. Yeah, that's about what they put yeah. in there. 
And these you can take. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. 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 These these are the these are the cut plant. Aren't they fun? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna staple them shut so they don't come apart. Make sure we're not stapling your fingers. Are you done with the break? Get some of these. Did, did you get cup plant seeds down there? So that one won't. You want this one?